Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Uh, Proverbs 14.14. 14. I mentioned that I was going to be preaching sort of along the lines of last week. And um, I want you to pray for me this morning. My mind is running all over directions and it's kind of hard to, for some reason to hold my thoughts together. That happens every now and then. Um, I, I've been praying about when I, um, when we get back from our trip in Las Vegas um, to preach a series of messages on um, godly manhood, godly husbandhood, what God um, calls us to be as men as husbands, as fathers, grandfathers, aged men, uh, men, leaders in the church. Um, God did place the responsibility of the leadership of the church uh, into the hands of the men it's not a slam against womanhood. W women have their own unique gifts that men do not have. And um, you'll find that when you uh, attempt to fulfill a role that is not yours, that God uh, did not give to you, you'll find a lot of heartache. You'll find a lot of emptiness. You'll find a lot of... Uh, You'll find a lot of sin in that. Um, but just to preach on, it's been a while since I've done that, to preach on how men ought to be. How they're to treat their children, how to treat their wives, how to, how to live the example uh, to their own children. And to young people in the church. Um, and then follow that up with godly womanhood. Being a godly wife, a godly spouse. Being an example, uh, a godly example to the younger women. Being a godly example to the children in the church. Um, there were women when I was growing up here that um, really was a blessing to me in my younger years. Some of them were my teachers, my Sunday school teachers. Uh, and then there were women in the church back then that I avoided. Because generally sometimes they were not very nice people sometimes. Um, and then maybe after that, Lord allows, uh, I'll preach to the children on how they should be. You know, Paul, Paul was sort of raising young Timothy to be a young minister to end up being the bishop of the church that Paul had started. And he said, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. I believe it's possible, I, in fact, I know this, I believe it's entirely possible and feasible that some of our young people can live a far more dedicated life to Christ than some of the adults do. And in that, we ought not discourage that simply because we feel guilty by that. We ought to be encouraged by it and in many cases follow their example. You say, well, they're just kids. Yeah, but out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, God said, he'd, he'd draw forth praise. 
So it doesn't matter how old you are, how many years of experience you have. It doesn't matter that if it's been bad experience, then it's you're not you're not living right. So help me pray about that. It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of study, a lot of research and uh, a lot of dwelling in the scriptures to find out what we should be. I promise you that I will not preach down to anybody. I do not consider myself as have attained to the things that I'm going to preach. But the mere fact that I'm preaching them to me means that if I preach them, I also must live by them as well. One of the things that God has helped me understand in the ministry is, Mike, you can't be perfect. You're not ever going to be perfect. But don't let that shy you away from preaching what is right, even if you're guilty of breaking and violating what is right. Preach on your sins. And I've always tried to do that uh, over the years. Uh, Proverbs chapter 14, you have it open there. Let's back up just a little bit. Uh, this part of the Proverbs, he gives us sort of a lesson every verse. There's a new point of wisdom in every verse and at this section of the book of Proverbs. In the early part of the book of Proverbs, he deals in like a whole chapter with one main theme. But then he gets to this part and it's just like one one wise saying after another. So let's back up just a little bit and get the context of this. Uh, let's go to, um, oh, let's go up to verse 11 of Proverbs 14 and read down our way through verse 14. That, verse 11, the house of the wicked shall be overthrown. And God is the one who's going to make sure of that. All of the people in this world that you think are getting away with wickedness, God swears to you they're not going to get away with anything. God is going to make sure that judgment comes to them, whether it's in this life. And I know what we want. We want to see all the bad people of the world get punished in front of our eyes so that we know that they get punished. Understand this. You're going to live, if you're saved, you are going to live past your death. Amen? You're going to live past your death. And if you live past your death, then don't worry. You're going to see the punishment of the wicked. He said in Psalm 91, Only with thine eyes shalt thou see the, the judgment of the wicked. So he said, The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. And when he talks about tabernacle, he means exactly that, the tabernacle. And he's talking about our bodies He's talking about where God dwells in us and the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown. Verse 12. And this goes into what we're going to look at in verse 14. The uh, excuse me. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I want to encourage you, be careful about saying things like, I don't see anything wrong with this, or I don't see anything wrong with that, or especially concerning your own life, I don't see anything wrong with what I'm doing. You should never, Paul said, judging ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise. Number one, do not ever compare others to yourself. Number two, never compare yourself to others. Now, you may not be smoking crack. You may not be sharing multiple partners. You may not be living an absolute total life dedicated totally to sin. But if still in your life there is a sin that is not repented of, not turned against, that you're still pursuing, still chasing after, still wanting to be a part of, 
You are absolutely no different than the crackhead, the dopehead, the adulterer, the pedophile, the homosexual, and everybody else for that matter. You're no different. Stop comparing others to yourself and do not compare yourself to others. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You are to get your standard of living and your judgments of living and how you're supposed to live your life, you're supposed to get those from the Word of God and no other source. Somebody say amen. Verse 13, even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful and the end of that mirth is heaviness. I've had times where I've been in deep, dark places, dark depression and thinking, well, I just need to watch some kind of funny show on television That'll make me laugh and that'll, that'll get rid of my problems. It doesn't work that way. If you find yourself in a place of deep sorrow, if you find yourself in a place of deep depression, if you find yourself, and, or, or watch this, some people won't turn to mirth and laughing. Some people will turn to alcohol. They'll turn to drugs. They'll turn to sex. They'll turn to just about any other worldly physical body pleasure in order to relieve themselves of the sorrow and the depression that they're in. And I'm here to tell you that is a death trap. Those of you who have been in it, say amen. amen. You turn your, you take the problems that are in your life. Those, those who have addictions, I can tell you the first thing they think of when some bad thing happens or when some, some event happens like they, they're getting into it with their wife or their husband or they're getting into it with somebody at work or their boss is coming down to them, their first immediate thought is, I need to go get high, I need to go get drunk. That's what they want to turn to. Amen, Amen to that. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Now verse 14. The backslider in heart, backslider in heart. Let me share something with you while I'm thinking about it. Those that backslide, I would say more than likely, just from my own experience, counseling with other people, watching it happen in other people, generally, being backslidden is premeditated. You know what that means? It means you thought about it beforehand, figured out that you were going to do it, made up all the reasons why you were going to do it, and then you did it. Notice that he said, he didn't say the backslider in his mind, the backslider in his brain, the backslider in his medulla obligata, the backslider in whatever, his cerebral cortex. He didn't mention a part of your brain, he mentioned your heart. And if you remember here for a while back, I showed you that the heart of man has brain cells on it, over 40 thousand brain cells exist on your physical heart. The parts of your brain that cause you to think, God put those cells on your heart. So when he says heart, he literally means your heart. Your heart is sort of in the center of your body. It is at the core of your being. I believe your soul is connected to your heart. And the soul then is what has, the soul has decided. Now, my flesh wants to backslide every day. Every day. My flesh wants to run out on God, leave, quit, go out and sin, do whatever I want to. That's my flesh. My heart, my soul doesn't want to do that. My soul knows the consequences of it. I'm going to feel God's punishment, God's chastening all the way down deep in my soul. And that causes me, I don't want to do that ever again. God, thank you for whipping me that hard. I never want to go do that again. 
I've had my mama whip me so hard, so hard at times I wish I had never been born. That hurt so bad. So the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Once you start premeditating backsliding, God says, fine. I'm going to give you exactly what you wanted. Now I want you to think of the story of the prodigal son while we're doing this. I, I had planned on going there, but I want you to think of that story. That young man did not wake up one day and say, I don't want to be part of this anymore. I'm leaving this afternoon. That was in his mind probably for weeks or months. I'm sick of this place. I'm sick of my dad telling me what to do all the time. I'm sick of following the rules all the time. All I do is work, work, work. I've had it. Father, he finally goes to his dad. Father, give me my inheritance. I want it now. His father, let me tell you, his father was wise. He was wise, not foolish. You want your inheritance, son? Fine, I'll give it to you. Knowing that his son would squander it, have nothing left, but he would have gained the experience of having turned his back on his father, his family, his way of life, and that more than likely, he would come back to his father saying, Father, that was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. Father, will you have me back? I think his father knew that. Because I believe the father was out looking for his son to come back. Every single morning he went out looking for his son. Because the Bible says he saw him coming from a long distance, a far distance away. I believe that man was looking for his son to come back. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Let's go to prayer. Father, I don't know how to preach this message. I know about backsliding. I know about backsliding. I know what can lead to it. I know what it does. I know what people think. I know what I thought. I pray, dear God, that you would help me preach this message. Lord, there may be somebody sitting here today that is backslidden. Or there may be somebody here today that is considering it. They're premeditating it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that if any walk away from these precepts and judgments that you've given us in this book, these right ways of living, God, that you would show us that it's not peaches and roses and ice cream on the other side. That it's literally where hell awaits us to damn our souls forever. And Father, there may be those here this morning, Father, that have already backslid and come back and they know exactly what I'm talking about. And you've already put it in their mind, God, that they're never going to turn their back on you ever again. It's not worth it. The trouble they got into, the mess that they made, they considered themselves blessed that you brought them back out of grace and out of mercy and out of love. So, Father, I ask you, God, to help me preach this message. I don't know how to do it. I pray, dear God, that something I say may reach to somebody's heart somewhere and save a soul from turning their back on you and turning it in such a way, Lord, as that they never come back. So, Father, just have your way in this message. Bless your word. Help us, dear God, Father, make application in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. Usually on things like this, I don't have a lot of what I call preaching words to say. Because I, I just don't know exactly what all to say. I, but I, I do have verses enough to give you. 
And I'm going to give you the verses. To me, this would be then a warning to you. A warning to each and every one of you. Let me, let me just say it like this. My sister and I grew up in this church. We grew up with quite a few young people over the years. We've seen them come in. Their parents came here usually. We even had some that came whose parents didn't come. There aren't many of the young people that we went to church with that to this day are in church. While they hit, when I was when I was baptized, 1975, there was uh, a, a whole bunch of us that I think had come back from Bible camp, uh, had gone down to the altar and asked Jesus to save us. And uh, I remember it was quite a few of them because they made me go last because I had poison ivy. They did. They made me go last. They said, one look at me with that calamine lotion all over me. And Brother Robert Sherry, who was the pastor then, said, uh, Mike, you're last. We don't want to get it all over everybody else. So there was quite a few there that night that was baptized. And again, I don't, I don't know, but I'm just not real sure that many of those that were baptized that night, 1975, are even in church this very day. They may have come to a temporary knowledge of truth and lived it semi as long as they were with mom and dad but as soon as they got away from mom and dad they left they left mom and dad they left the bible they left the church they left it all behind in some cases they come back in most cases they don't you'll find that to be true not just in this church but in practically every church i don't care how conservative strict or liberal they are Generally, the children that are raised up in church, once they get a taste of the world, generally do not come back. So I'm going to say this like this. Those that are considering or thinking about going back. Now, last week I preached about those who just completely turned their back on God and never come back. Today, the, the word is backsliding, which means that they are sliding in that direction, but it doesn't have to be permanent. God can still bring you back from that. He can keep your feet from sliding and put a rope around you and rescue you or reach down with his hand and pull you out of the pit or whatever it is. God can do that for you. And those of you who God has done that for, would you raise your hand? Hands all over the building. So let today then just be a, a reminder to, for you to give God the praise and the thanks for bringing you back. Somebody say amen. But I'm telling you, the sins of the past still can be a draw in our lives. They can draw us. The devil can seduce us with them. Devils can surround us, devils can pound us, devils can press on us, entice us to go back to the old ways, to go back to the old days, to go back to doing the things that we used to do, or in some cases doing things that we never even thought of doing. Usually most people, when they, when they as adults who smoke cigarettes, started when they were young people. I've seen adults who never smoked a day in their life all of a sudden start smoking cigarettes. And I'm just going, what in the world is that? So in some cases, you can go back to things or go into things that you never, ever considered going into before. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19. Here's what God said. Now, this would be then, listen to this now, 
This is how God will use backsliding to bring you back to a better relationship with Him. Jeremiah 2.19 He said, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. What is He saying by that? God is saying that, okay, uh, let's say that um, you were brought up in a Christian home and um, uh, you, you lived a Christian life and your mom and daddy, they didn't let you watch this on television. They didn't let you listen to this kind of music. They didn't let you hang around these certain types of people. And uh, that kind of upset you a little bit. How come I can't have fun like everybody else is having fun? And, and, and that, that may be how it is. But once you get to that age and... And, and you get out on your own, let's say you go to college somewhere, or you go off in the military somewhere, or you go run off with some boy somewhere, or some girl somewhere, or you get a job and move out on your own and get your own place, and then all of a sudden now you think, oh, I'm free. I don't have to, I don't have to call home, tell mom where I'm at. I don't have to tell mom that I'm out at some place, or I don't have to have mom's permission anymore. I can go, come and go as I please and do what I want. The devil is waiting for that day to introduce to you sins that beforehand you never thought of or your parents, you just knew your parents wouldn't let you get at them and then you get out there, start messing around with it. Then after a while you find out there was a reason why your parents told you to stay away from those people and your parents told you to stay away from that guy and your parents told you to stay away from those drugs and that alcohol and that bar life and everything else because you've been beaten, you've been robbed, the drugs have got a hold of you, your life is a mess, you end up wanting to kill yourself and God is using wickedness to correct you. Somebody say amen. You realize that that life does not bring with it the joy and the satisfaction that you can have living for Jesus Christ. That's what you find out. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. God just might let you slide back and go back from Him and understand what it's like to be starving to death, both physically and spiritually. To find out that you have no other place to go because no one will let you live with them anymore because of the mess that you've made out of your life. You've ran through your friends. They won't give you money anymore. You, your parents, they won't give you money anymore. Nobody will help you. You'll find out that the friends that you thought you had, they are not your friends. And what will happen is your wickedness will correct you and your backsliding shall reprove thee. God will make sure it happens that way. And then he said, uh, Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and what? Bitter. The vine of Sodom is bitter. So is a life that's filled with drugs, alcohol, adulteries, perversions of every kind. It is a bitter, sad, horrible life. The man that I led to the Lord who was dying of AIDS, the AIDS had so taken, by the time I got to him to pray the sinner's prayer with him, the AIDS had advanced in his brain so much that he was not able to finish most of his sentences. That's what his free lifestyle did. Oh, I want to be free to do whatever I want. And that's what it turned him into. It is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. And by the way, Isaiah 11, turn there very quickly. I have it there on the bottom of the screen. I didn't print it out because I want you to look at it. Some of you know what it is already, but for those of you who don't, Isaiah 11 verse 2 delineates or spells out what the seven spirits of God are. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord, that's the first one, shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, 
the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. You no long, you get to a place where you no longer have the fear of the Lord, and that's a dangerous place to be. In fact, more than likely, that's what led to your backsliding to begin with. You see, there are things that I will not do. I won't entertain the thoughts of doing them. I'm going to stay a million miles away from them because I know what God will do to me if I do them. And I don't want that. Thing, things that your mama tried to teach you, that your daddy tried to teach you. If I catch you doing this again, the whipping's going to be three times as hard. And if you had a fear of your mama or your fear of your daddy, you just didn't do those things anymore. I lipped off to my mom sitting in, she had a 1976 Chevy Nova hatchback. Spirit of 76. You remember the 76? Remember that year? Everything was bicentennial stuff. I'm sitting in the front seat of that Nova. We were in the church parking lot leaving. She said, I don't remember what she said. I don't remember what I said back to her, but I smarted off and lift off to her. And the next thing I know, her hand is coming across the, the top front of my face and bl I'm tasting blood inside my mouth. I'm crying. I don't remember what it was I said, but I promise you I never said it again ever after that. Never did. The fear of the Lord stopped me. I want to tell you something about your backsliding. God may be letting it happen for a reason. Because your thinking is wrong. You think that once you get free, and, and I'm, I can be, I'm not just preaching this to, to teenage kids, I'm preaching this to adults. Who think, boy, if I can just get rid of my husband, if I can just get rid of my wife, I'll be free to do whatever I want to do. Well, let me ask you a question. If you were to think about it down deep in your heart, is that really a good idea? That you finally get freedom to do whatever you want to do without any accountability. Is that a good idea for you? No. It's not. There are people more than likely sitting in this room right now wishing that they had someone watching over them to keep them away from certain sins. Jeremiah 3, turn there. I'm calling this the pretense of righteousness. You know what that is? You're pretending to be righteous, but you're backslid. Um, can't remember the man's name, but he used to sing. He started out singing baritone, then he went to singing tenor for the cathedral quartet, and he gave his testimony. He was singing gospel music, going from church to church singing gospel music. And the next morning he got up, he went to see the cathedrals. And he saw, heard George Yonts give his testimony about how he used to be a drunk, how he used to smoke marijuana. Even back in the early 50s, he was in the army smoking marijuana. And he said, I'm sitting there in church with a hangover because I had been drunk and I was singing gospel music. And he said, I heard him give his testimony. I'm telling you, it's very possible for you to be backslid, but pretending to be a pillar of the church. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 6. 
The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. When you play the harlot, there's two ways of doing that. Number one, actually several ways, but number one, you can be performing harlotries by yourself with things that you're seeing on the internet. Number two, you can be playing physical harlotry by running around on your spouse, cheating on your spouse. You can also play spiritual harlotry by pretending to serve God but down deep inside you've carved out a God that does not match the God of this Bible and that God allows you to keep all your sins while this God doesn't so he says in verse 7 and I said after she had done all these things turn thou unto me but she returned not and her treacherous sister Judah saw it and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Some say God hates all divorce. Not necessarily. The Bible says that God had betrothed himself to Israel. Meaning that they were engaged to be married, which in Israel law was a binding, it was just as if they were married. But they had not had the ceremony, nor had consummated the marriage. And so God, because of the backslidings and the wickedness of Israel, He put her away and gave her a bill of divorce. And He said, I'm done with you. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot. In other words, her sister saw it, didn't learn from the lesson, and went out and did exactly what her sister did. And verse 9, And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land, committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Stocks are pieces of wood. The stones and the stocks are what they carved idols out with. They carved out a different God other than Jehovah, God, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. They committed adultery with stones and stocks. Verse 10, And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. What does the word feignedly mean? She feigned it, meaning she fakes serving Jehovah by doing the rituals of the law. But then when they leave out of there, they go home, they've got an idol in a bush, they've got an idol on the hearth in their house, or they're worshiping some other god, or practicing burning incense to some other idol, or they're, they're in their mind and their heart, they're worshiping a God that is different than the God is in this book. And what this looks like in the 21st century is the people that come to church on Sunday look good, smell good, act good, say amen, carry their Bible, flop it up and down while the preacher's preaching, say amen, get excited about it, and act all saintly and Christian, walk out of here and immediately they are serving a different God that allows them to do whatever they want to do and commit all their sins. You're backslidden, don't even know it, and you're backslidden. That's dangerous. Because you keep coming to church, playing church, and pretending that everything's okay. And I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't want 
If we could, if we had 500 people trying to cram them in these pews every Sunday, I would not want the people here who are playing church and faking it and going out and live whatever kind of life they want to on the outside of this place. I wouldn't want them here. You know why? Eventually, they'll, they'll, they'll invade the rest of you. And you'll be seeing, well, they're doing this and they get away with this and they live like this. I guess I can live like that too and it'll be okay because Brother Bob does this. Brother Tom does this. Sister Lulu lives like this. Why can't I live like this? It is a pretense. You can be backslidden from God and live under a pretense of righteousness. Now verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thy iniquity. Here are the requirements now for you to come back. I have in times past had to do what I, I don't ever want to do. And that is exactly what Jesus said. Go to somebody who was a member of this church and say to them, I need to ask you about some things that I suspect that you're doing. Are you in fact doing these things? And in one particular case, the person admitted it. And I said, thank you for being honest. Can I pray with you as you ask God for repentance? And forgiveness of this sin. And this person said yes. And I'm in fear and trembling. I don't want to lose this person. And so I go to them. As the scripture says. And they repented. The sin was forgiven. You know whose business it is after that? Nobody's. Nobody's. Now, if they had not repented, I would have had to bring a second witness in to try the same thing, get them to repent. If they wouldn't have repented then, I would have had to bring it before the church. Then the church knows. I love each and every one of you. Don't ever make me do that. And I want to say this to my family. Don't ever make your dad do that to you. Don't ever make your dad do that to you. The best thing you can do is get on your face before God and repent of your own sins. And as of that point, it's just between you and God and nobody else. You believe that? Say amen. So if you want to come back from backsliding God says go and proclaim these words toward the north and say return thou backsliding Israel saith the Lord and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you for I am merciful saith the Lord and I will not keep anger forever only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree that's all you've got to do is repent. And God will bring you back. 
the prodigal son father upon the son returning and repenting. The father put a ring on his finger, a brand new robe on his shoulders, made a feast for his son and gave him back his sonhood. Although he was just wanting to come back and be a servant. He said, my father's servants have it better than I do. His father gave him his sonship back. And accepting him as his son. And God will do the same thing for you. If you will let him. But he said. Ye have not obeyed my voice saith the Lord. Turn O backsliding children saith the Lord. For I married unto you. And I will take one of you a city and two of a family. And I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding so that the backsliding never has to take place again. Never. 